Yeah. So the whole trick is to decompose the high frequency power from the low frequency power by <coughs> a finite number of point sources. Yes. So basically what they're doing is they're making them more. Do you want these lights on? When yeah, I'll when, when you can see it looks like this. You're missing past your cover? Some of point sources are plus. Excuse me, plus a very small object. Should we clone that? We're not going to do it a whole lot of things. Um. All right, everyone. Uh, welcome back from lunch. Hopefully you're well fed, ready for the afternoon session. Uh, the first part of this afternoon, uh, we're going to be hearing from Jake again. He's going to tell us about uh, generically Bayesian inference or Bayesian statistics. Okay, Bayesian yeah. statistics. And then a little bit later this afternoon, Robert's going to tell us about uh, introduction to image processing. So uh, you all already met Jake, so I'll just let him get started. Yeah, so um, this so uh, we have a couple hours to talk about Bayesian statistics. And as with most things, there's there's a lot more than can go in, in a few hours. So I'm, I'm roughly basing what, I'm, what we're going to discuss now on this uh, day-long tutorial that I gave at AAS uh, last year. So all the, in this repo right here, are all the notes from that tutorial, and that's like, like probably eight-ish hours of material if you, if you include all the um, exercises and stuff. So it's, it goes a lot more in depth than what I'm gonna do right now. So I'm hoping that, I'm hoping that in, in the next couple hours, I'll be able to, to brush over some of the important concepts, give, give you some, uh, some interesting problems to try out yourself. Uh, but then if you, if you want to go deeper, you can look into here and the resources that are listed in there. All right, so um, how many people have, have uh, how many people have thought much about Bayesian statistics or lear learned about Bayesian inference? Just a few. Okay, yeah. So w one of the things that um, I found was uh, I, I got like, a good way through my graduate career before anyone had even explained to me what the differences between Bayesian approach and frequentist approach to statistics. And um, the, it, what it really comes down to is um, it, Bayesian and frequentist approaches have a different definition of probability. So fundamentally, if you're, talk, if you're talking to a Bayesian or talking to a frequentist, it's a different de definition of probability. And the Bayesian definition of probability is uh, degree of belief. And the frequentist definition has to do with um, repeated trials. So I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit. But this is, this is really, I, I think, fundamental to understanding when, when someone talks about how they're doing a Bayesian approach versus a frequentist approach. So um, the probability is re repeated trials. The, the easiest way to think about this is um, if you're flipping a coin, everyone knows that the, the probability of landing heads is 50%, right? But what, what fundamentally does that mean when, you're, when you say that the probability is 50%? A frequentist would say that, um, well, that means that if you uh, flip the coin over and over and over and do this many, many, many times, then in the, then in the long term limit, you'll get, you're expected to get about 50% heads and 50% tails, right? So fundamentally, it's about having, having something that you can do over and over, and then the frequency of the results is related to that probability. That's fundamentally what probability is to frequentism. In Bayesianism, it's a little bit different. Um, the, the 50% probability is, is like a degree of belief. So you don't need a reference to repeated trials. All you need is a reference to like your certainty about the object. So when a Bayesian says that it, the probability of flipping a coin is 50%, he says uh, that, that means that there's like a 50% certainty that, um, that there's a 50, that your, your knowledge is like, uh, how, how should I say this? There's a 50% certainty that that single toss will land heads, right? So, and, and this, um, this, is, this is really funny because this leads to, uh, to lots of like arguments between people who prefer the Bayesian approach and people who prefer the frequentist approach. Because literally like the, the definition of your fundamental term is different 
And when you when you have a discussion where your fundamental definition of terms are different, then you start to get some not not very fruitful discussions sometimes. It's like uh, there's uh, one one of my good friends uh, is a, a professor of statistics down at um, Berkeley. And he always just like rails on Nate Silver and the 538 group because they use probabilities to talk about, um, you know, Hillary Clinton's going to win with 60% probability or whatever. And he's always like, those probabilities are meaningless because you can't have repeated trials of the same election. Um, but that's because he's using a freq frequentist view of, of probability. So anyway, this is, this is this fundamental difference. And I just want to put that out there so that you have that in your mind when um, to, to give you a framework to think about statements that people make about these things. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah. So using the Bayesian uh, like definition of probability, mm -hmm. how would you explain a coin flip then? What do you mean? How do you explain it? So like for like frequent frequentists, like yeah. you just say, oh, you have fifty percent probability mm -hmm. of being X or Y. Yeah. So how would you say that? Like with the Bayesian language? Well, the, the language is the same. You'd still say we have a 50% okay. probability of landing heads. But um, the Bayesian is talking about that one event where the frequentist has this subtext okay. of saying it's a 50% chance of landing heads. And that's because this is a repeatable experiment. And in the imaginary case that I do it an infinite number of times, it would land 50%. Yeah. So, um, oh, I, I should say that. that the, the consequence of this is like, let's say you're trying to uh, learn about omega matter in the universe. Um, and you, a Bayesian might say something like the, the probability of some value of omega matter given the data and try to quantify something like this. And this is what, this is what Bayesians will do and we'll, we'll get into what we do with an expression like that. But a frequentist would say, well, nonsense. You can't do a probability of omega matter because there's only one universe. You know, you, there's no, in our universe, you can't do repeated trials where the value of omega matter comes up something different. You know, you, know, you, can, you can measure a different value, and that's, that's a different thing. But like model parameters in frequentism are these fixed things that you can't make probabilistic statements about. Yeah? I, I'm going to add a short cultural note, which is that this like these two camps have like warred literally over centuries and then, like Bayesianism was equivalent to witchcraft to a lot of people for, a, I'm not even kidding, for a really long time. So I'll put in the Slack a link to a book that I promise you is the most interesting book on statistics you will ever read. Which one is that? <laughs> Called The Theory That Would Not Die. Oh yeah, the I love that one. Of yeah. that, That's the most interesting, uh, the, the other most interesting book, if. If you want to dig into like Bayesianism completely, there's this Jane's, uh, this classic Jane's textbook that has probability in the title. I can't remember it right now, but that's like, he, <laughs> it's awesome. So, so Jane's, uh, kind of the cultural note, Jane's was this physicist back in the 20th century who uh, was one of the people who was instrumental in making Bayesianism an acceptable approach to, uh, to use in science. And he has this, this tome of a textbook that basically starts, starts from ground zero and says, what do we know, what axioms do we know about the world? And from there derives Bayesian statistics. And it's, um, it, it's a phenomenal read, but you need to like take it like two pages at a time. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, this, this point is, is really interesting because uh, it, when we come to later to derive like the fundamental pieces of Bayesian statistics, this the fact that frequentists won't make probabilistic statements about model parameters is the the fundamental consequence of this fundamental difference of, of uh, definitions. Okay, so I'm I'm hoping now that you know when someone asks you what's the difference between Bayesianism and frequentism, you can say it's definition of probability. That's what it comes down to, and some of the consequences. We'll Okay, so any any other questions about that? Thanks for asking yours. All right. So um, in Bayesian Bayesian inference, there there are two uh, kind of domains that we'll talk about. Um, one of them is uh, is model fitting. And one of them is model selection. 
And this is, uh, I should say, this isn't just like a Bayesian thing. The, the frequentist camp talks about the difference between model fitting and model selection too. But I, um, I, I want to start with those categories because they're they're uh, two they're two completely different problems in statistics, and the, the tools you end up using um, to do these are are somewhat different. So model fitting is like uh, if you have a you have some data and it looks something like this. Let's say you're fitting a line to the data. Model fitting is saying that given the line, given given that I want to fit a line to my data, what's the best slope and intercept? So that's model fitting. You say I'm I'm fitting a line to my data. I want to I want to figure out what the slope is. I want to figure out the intercept. The model selection is like saying. Uh, does a line fit? And if you if you think about these two things, they're they seem kind of similar at first blush, but they they're really fundamentally different, right? Given given any data set, I can find a line of best fit, right? But but that doesn't necessarily mean that a line is a good model for my data. And answering this, does a line fit my data well, is a, a really subtle thing. Um, and actually, even in my, uh, even in that like eight-hour tutorial that I listed there, we didn't quite get into model selection. We were just, just focused on model fitting. So mo model selection is this thing that um, there, there are good tools in both the frequentist paradigm and the Bayesian paradigm to do it, but um, it's good to good to understand that this is a, a distinction as you're moving forward. Okay, so so those are the two like overarching things concepts that I wanted to give before we start diving into what's actually going on with Bayesian analysis. So is everyone happy with that? The the difference between these two? Yeah. And oh, I should say that um, model fitting is the easy thing. Like, it's that that's why everyone will start with it. It's it's pretty easy to say given a model, does this model? You know, what's the best what's the best version of this model that fits the data? But model selection is hard, and and model selection turns out to be where the real meat of the science is. Like for example, if you take a Kepler light curve and you say um, and you want to ask answer the question, is there a planet around this system? That's a model selection question, right? Because you can you can create a model of what the planet would look like in the data. And um, you can always fit that model to the data, but af asking if that model is a good fit to the data is the key to saying if there's a planet there or not. So um, in the sixth or sixth or seventh notebook of that um, tutorial, we're not going to get to that today, but you can look in there. We actually look at the uh, question of uh, taking a Kepler light curve and discovering a planet in the data and asking whether the whether the planet exists. So. Um, Anyway, those are the two distinctions. So today um, I'm going to talk about mostly about Bayesianism and primarily about model fitting, this idea of if I have a model, how what's the best version of that model that fits the data. Okay? So um, all right, let's erase this here, because you already have the definition of prob probability again. Ready? So in, in Bayesianism, Fundamentally, the result that we want to compute is the probability of science. <laughs> right? Where science here is the, the scientific model we're interested in. Like, what, what is the probability of uh, a certain set of cosmological parameters given the, the data we're looking at? Or probability that there's a planet around the star? The probability that this object is an AGN versus uh, you know, just a star? Something like that. Um, but we, we can't just look at, at science by itself, right? Probability of science. We need, to, we need to add in the data that we're using to get that probability. So basically, we're, we're doing the probability of science given the data, right? So this is, this is the, Bayesian, um, the Bayesian result we're looking for, probability of science given data. And as you go a little, a little bit deeper in things, you realize that you know, the probability of science given data, there's, there's some fundamental of assumptions that we put in here. So what we're actually doing is probability of the science given the data and the uh, um, information. I'm just going to 
I call it info right there. So info is like the background information. You know, we make some assumptions, like we we assume that Einstein's field equations actually describe reality, right? If we're doing some sort of cosmological thing, we, we make some assumptions about how the universe behaves, right? So I, uh, you always need that, that info in there. Um, and the other thing is, is oftentimes we're, when we're measuring this probability of science, there are, there are other things that come into the picture that we don't really care about necessarily. So for example, say our science here is the, the orbital parameters of a planet going around a star. Um, there are some orbital parameters, like for example, the, the, the phase that we don't really care about, right? We don't, uh, it, it affects the model because the phase tells you tells the model when the transits take place. But um, in the end, we don't really care about the phase. We want to kind of throw that away because that's, you know, that's, that's not telling us anything fundamental about the system. So this, uh, so what it, what it ends up being is we have the probability of science um, and these nuisance parameters. Um, given the data, and our background info. So this is this is starting to be a little bit of a mouthful, right? So um, in in Bayesian analysis, we'll tend to uh, represent these with variables that help us shorten things. So um, the variables that I'll use for the science are these uh, thetas. So you can think of theta as just a vector of values. It might be all the Kepler parameters of the planetary system, or it might be all the cosmological parameters that you're interested in in determining. And these are the, I'm going to call this theta S for science, and then there's the theta N for the nuisance parameters. And then the data, we'll just call it a big D, and the info is a big I. And so this right here is what we're trying to compute in Bayesianism. The Bayesian approach is looking for, looking to, to compute this. And when you see things like the, um, you know that like banana diagram that you see in cosmological papers with omega matter versus W or whatever. That's this. That's this thing that's called the. Um, it's called the posterior. Well, let me erase this. And so this is the this is the goal of Bayesian analysis, is the Bayesian posterior. And the Bayesian posterior, like I said, will look something like, you know, if you have an omega matter versus W, it's kind of this like contour plot that um, will zero in on the on the right value of that. So you, you can, in two dimensions, you can calculate this Bayesian posterior and um, find find the maximum, and then given the spread of this distribution, that'll give you some idea about the uncertainty and the correlations and and the parameters you're finding, right? Does that, that all make sense? So when you when you see one of these one of these Bayesian results, think posterior and think probability of science given data. Now this gets a this itself even gets a little bit cumbersome. So um, in in most cases you'll see this just shortened, and you we can put the the two thetas together for the time being and just call it one theta vector, and um, we'll just say the data over here. And a lot of people leave out this this I right there, that information, just because basically everything in the world is conditioned on our understanding of science and, and what we assume to be true, right? So I, I'm going to write this here, this P of theta given D, but I want you to understand that that theta given D is the science plus the nuisance parameters given D and whatever background information we're assuming about the universe, right? So. Um, if this is the if this is the result that we're trying to compute, p of theta given d, and Bayesian analysis, what's the what what do you think a frequentist comment on this would be? What would what would they say? Yeah. Yeah, well, you have. Well, one model. Uh, it has to be. Um, yeah, yeah it's, so I think I think what you're saying is that this, you know, this theta represents something. This theta represents a model of the universe. 
And to ask about the probability of a model, the model of the universe is meaningless to a forgiveness, right? They, you, can't, you can't have these, these multiple universes. Um, so fundamentally, what, what the Bayesian, what Bayesian inference is aiming at is a quantity that uh, a frequentist approach would say is meaningless, right? So, so this definition of probability in the beginning ends up, brings us to, to completely different places. So, um, so in um, uh, how, how am I going to exactly say this? So the, the problem is we don't have an expression to compute this quantity. The probability of the model given the data is something um, that we can't compute directly. But what we do have, what we can do is something like this: the probability of the data given the model. And this is, this is exactly what uh, Maria talked about earlier. This is the uh, likelihood. And to, to think about why we, can, why we can express this, it's like if you're, what, what the likelihood is, is you say, like you, you specify a model and you say, I have this particular line that's fitting my data. I'm gonna erase this and not make this a posterior plot anymore, but actually make it a, uh, a y versus x plot with, with a line that we're fitting to our data. Um, and let's say this is a particular particular theta, theta 1 or whatever. So this is a line that we're trying to fit to our data. And we can, we can ask how well this model fits our data, right? We can, we can do things like compare, compare all, the, all the distance of the points to the line along the y direction and do the you know, sum of, of y, i minus the model squared, that sort of thing, and compute this chi-squared type thing, and that's related to the, the likelihood that Maria talked about earlier. So the, when you do classic, classic straight line fits in the, in the frequentist paradigm, you're doing something like this, which is essentially just computing this likelihood, the probability of the data given the model. So that's something we can do, right? But the, the problem is, is that this is not true. The probability of data given the model does not equal the probability of the model given the data. So, so we want, in Bayesian, in Bayesian uh, modeling, we want to compute this, but we only have the tools to compute this. So we have to figure out some expression that relates this P of theta given data to P of data given theta. Right, so this is where, um, this is where we start to be able to do things like, uh, where we start to look at the kinds of statements about probability that Marina made, or that Maria made earlier, and um, and think about how we can use those axioms of probability to relate what we want to know to what we do know here. And so this is this is pretty fun stuff if you. Uh, if you get jazzed about algebra and manipulating quantities, right? We know that the conditional probability, we know the definition of this is just P of theta and the data together divided by P of data. So this is the, I should put a, a three equals here. This is a definition of, of conditional probability that we looked at earlier. And um, this is the, the kind of thing that, um, we saw earlier. We saw it as sort of a Venn diagram type thing, where you're looking at one one section of the at, at how this this joint probability compares to the total. And the, the thing is that this uh, this is completely symmetric too, right? If we look at our other piece, the p of data given theta, that's also equal to p of theta given data, but we're just dividing by p of theta instead. And now. Um, you can use the, uh, the algebra skills that we all know and love, right? To, um, let's say you, you, know, you multiply this by P of theta, and you cross that out, and now you have a quantity here. You can substitute this in. And what you end up with is this P of theta given data equals P of data given theta times P of theta over the P of data. Right, and this right here, this is Bayes' theorem or Bayes' rule, depending on who you ask. And um, 
what we've done now is we've, we have an expression that we can use to get the thing that we want, this P of theta given data, in terms of something that we know we can compute. So this is the expression we want, this is the likelihood that we can compute, and these are some other terms, right? So one thing to note here is that this, the, the, this Bayes rule right here is not something that um, anyone disagrees about. Like, uh, even a frequentist would look at this statement and say, like, this is a correct statement of probability. It's not, it's not Bayes' rule itself that, that causes the controversy. What causes the controversy is when you, um, when you assign something to these values and you say, for example, theta is a fixed model parameter. Because then when you, when you, make, this, when you make this swap of, uh, of dependent and independent variables via a Bayes' rule, you end up saying, making a probabilistic statement about theta, and that's the thing that Bayesians are okay with and frequentists are not okay with. All right, so, so this is Bayes' rule. And, and just to, um, to, to list these out, these are, the, the terms in Bayes' rule are pretty important to understand because it's, that's the fundamental piece of knowing how to compute this result. So the, as we said before, the P of theta given data this is called the posterior, or um, the full name is the posterior probability. So this is the, the thing you're interested in, right? Um, this P of data given theta, like I mentioned before, is uh, known as the likelihood. And this is the thing that, that we, can, we can calculate, and it's actually, um, in, in most cases is the exact same quantity that the frequentists are maximizing in order to solve for the best theta. So that, that's, that's kind of an um, intersection of the, of the Bayesian and the frequentist approach is that they both depend on this likelihood in, in most cases. There are some there are non-likelihood methods that frequentists use as well. Um, then this P of theta is what's known as the prior. Um, and this part, this P of theta, this prior, is probably the most, um, most controversial piece of uh, Bayesian analysis. Because think about what this is saying. This is saying, the prior is saying, what do I know about my answer before I looked at any data, right? So what do I know about the universe before I observed any stars? Uh, that, that's the prior right there. And you can see why that might be a little bit problematic, because you know, how do you, how do you make any, any statements about the universe before you've observed it, right? And there are, there are some various approaches that Bayesians use for this, and I'll come back to that in a second. But you should know that the prior is the, the place where people uh, start, to, start to chip away at Bayesian, Bayesianism. And this, um, this P of data, this is another slightly problematic term. This is sometimes called the uh, evidence, um, but I don't like that term because uh, it's like I don't I don't really know why someone decided to call that the evidence. the uh, The term that I like for this, and this is something that came out of the out of David Hogg's camp and and some other people, I like to call this the fully margin marginalized likelihood. And it's extremely difficult to compute. And if you ever need to actually compute this, you'll see why this acronym is important. Um, because it's, it's, really, it's really hard. You need to, because essentially if you, if you look at what this is, a P of data, the reason this is a fully marginalized likelihood is a good, good term for it is that if you, you can compute this by um, using the definitions that we saw earlier. Um, so it would be P of data given theta times P of theta d theta. Whoops. So um, what we're doing, we're fully marginalizing the likelihood. So this is a likelihood right here. And we're integrating, or in, in Bayesian terms, uh, integrating over something is, is also known as marginalizing it for various reasons. But we're integrating over all possible models. And um, 
we're, we're integrating the, the likelihood over all possible models to get this. So we're marginalizing the likelihood over all possible models. And this is really, really hard to compute in general because theta, you know, maybe if theta is a one dimensional thing, like a single parameter model, it might be easy. But often theta has something like, you know, 20, 20 to 30 parameters. And if you've ever tried to do a numerical integration in a 20 dimensional space, it's just nasty. You know, it's, it's horrible. Now, the good thing about this, um, good thing about the, uh, the FML is that in most cases you don't have to compute it. So um, if, you, if you look at this right here, this expression, which I, I hope you can read it, everything kind of ran together, but this integra integral over the likelihood times the prior is basically just integrating over the numerator right here. So integrating over the numerator and sticking that into the denominator is the same as normalizing this expression. So this, um, in most cases, this can just be considered a normalization term. So you can um, you can get rid of it. And what people write instead for the model fitting case is this p of theta given data is proportional to p of data given theta, the likelihood times the prior. And you can just uh, you can just get rid of that. And, and the reason you can do that is because you're using this expression to try to learn about theta. And um, as theta varies, this this denominator doesn't change. So so the the actual value of the if you're trying to like maximize this posterior, the actual value of the denominator doesn't doesn't come into it. It doesn't matter. Right. So this is. Um, I wish I could write more neatly on here. Sorry about that. But, uh, but this is the, the fundament, these are the fundamental components of uh, Bayesian analysis. You have Bayes' theorem. You have the prior, which you're trying to compute. You have the likelihood, which you um, know how to compute. You have the sorry, posterior. You have the likelihood. You have the prior, which you have to figure out somehow. And I'll go into that in a second. And you have the, uh, the FML on the bottom. <laughs> All right, so any any questions there? Does that mean this was this was eminently clear and I didn't I didn't make any yeah. So you said we calculate those things. Mm How? -hmm. Oh. Yeah, I'm gonna get to that. Don't worry. <laughs> Do you yeah. want to have to calculate the FML when you're doing like model comparison? When you're doing, um, it, it does come into play in some model comparison because uh, basically in model comparison you, ask, you have to ask, is the absolute value of this prior better for one model versus the other? There's some ways that you can, you can get around that. Um, and if you don't mind, I don't want to go into that now because it'll, it'll be jumping down a rabbit hole. But there, it, I guess the answer is you don't you don't always need this for model comparison, but um, sometimes you do, and uh, when you do, it it gets messy. Okay. So I hope that now, if I say posterior or likelihood or prior or um, FML or evidence, that you'll know kind of generally what I'm talking about, because this this is going to be the vocabulary of doing this Bayesian inference. Yeah. In the presence of sufficient amounts of data. Is there any fundamental difference between maximize between finding the maximum of the posterior and finding the maximum of the uh, MOA? Yeah, that's a good question. So if you um, you're asking if you if you maximize this side, is there is there any if, if you have a lot of data, does the basically does the prior have any effect, right? And if you have a if you have a whole lot of data, the answer is usually no, and that's that's nice. So you can if you're just trying to maximize the posterior. You can often maximize the likelihood, and and um, uh, a frequentist would say, well, that's why Bayesianism works because in the you know in the n case you're just doing the frequentist thing, and a Bayesian would say, oh, that's why frequentism works because in the n case you're just doing the Bayesian thing. <laughs> um, there there are there are good reasons to maximize the likelihood and think about it fundamentally from that approach, but there are, there are also really nice reasons for for maximizing this, and I'll I'll get to that I'll get to that in just a little bit. So um, I'm going to erase these terms, mainly because I can't read them anymore. Uh, 
And I want to talk a little bit about the, the prior, this, this P of theta. So the a probability of the the probability of the, the science things we're trying to compute before we see any data. Um, does it, anyone have ideas or, or thoughts on how we might quantify this? How how might how might we uh, we write down something that'll give us that prior? Like physical laws. Physical laws. Yeah. So you mean uh, like if you have an idea of how an oscillator moves. Yeah, yeah. So you have you have some sort of like I'm going to call this uh, I'm going to put this under um, empirical prior. So slash physical laws, something like that. So this is stuff that we can just assume about the universe. Like for example, um, if we're trying to compute the prior on something like omega matter, we might set the prior so that omega matter can't be less than zero, right? We we sort of know that there's not a negative mass density in the universe, and that that's something that you you can do. And they, yeah, physical laws. If you know, if you have some sort of physical intuition or empirical intuition about how the how the parameters are, and this is this is honestly the best kind of prior. If you can justify the prior somehow through previous scientific knowledge, then that's really really the best way to go. Um, any other ideas about about how we might use a prior? Yeah? I don't know what it is, but I've heard people talk about flat priors. Yeah, yeah, so I've flat priors. Before. Uh, so, so what's a flat prior? Flat prior is uh, basically you say if you have a graph of this is the value of omega matter and the probability of omega matter, you just say that the probability is flat. It's like you know, equal probability everywhere. So this seems to be um, this is this is a popular one uh, because it, it sort of it sort of gets at this idea of um, having no knowledge of the parameter, right? So some if you're if you're encoding your knowledge as a probability, you might as well say it's equally probable everywhere. <laughs> so that that's that, yeah. I was going to say, is that where you would include like? If you add uh, like observational constraints or biases or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So you, you could you could put like uh, some sort of empirical prior along with the flat prior and like limit this somewhere. The problem with the true flat prior is that it'll go from negative infinity to infinity, and you can't normalize it, right? So you need um, if you're actually if you're gonna if you're gonna use a flat prior, you um, <coughs> in practice need to set some hard limit somewhere or another. Um, and that's one of the things that, that frequentists love to complain about when Bayesians go to flat priors. Because it's an unnormalizable prior, and then at that point your probabilities really become meaningless, um, even though you can sort of progress forward. So that's a flat prior. One of the other problems is, um, you know, let, let's say that we, uh, let's say that we parameterized our model differently, right? If we if we have some parameter parameterized model of the of the universe that's in, instead in terms of something like sigma m squared, then the same flat prior becomes a non-flat prior that looks something like this. Um, so when you the pro, one of the main problems with this flat prior idea is that it really depends on how you define your model. If I define if I define my physical model in a different way, this is kind of silly because we don't really do this. But there are cases where we where we do choose one type of parameterization over another, and then it's it's not clear whether you should use the flat prior in one variable or in another variable. So that's that's an issue with the flat prior. And um, what what comes out of that when you uh, when you start talking about uh, different parameterizations of your model, there's this thing that's sort of a, a more general case of the flat prior, and this is a um, non-informative prior. And um, it's, it's basically like a, a more technically competent way of doing what you're trying to do with a flat prior. So non-informative prior, uh, there are these approaches using information theory to say what for whatever quantity I have in my model, 
what's the um, the least informative assumption that I can make about it given in an inform information theoretic sense? And um, this is kind of, I, I would say if you don't have, I should switch these two. This is the this is the order in which you should you should try to do it. If you have some sort of empirical prior, if you have actual science that can inform your assumptions of the data, then then you should use them. Otherwise, you should go for a non-informative prior. And if you have a model where the where the information theoretic stuff is difficult to work out, then often a flat prior is good. And and we even, we come back to what Nick was saying is that if um, if you have enough data in practice, we'll actually see this later. The choice of the prior, like non-informative versus flat, flat prior, matters very little. So, so that's the nice thing is that these difficulties only go away if you have, or these difficulties only show up if you have very few data points. Uh, so a lot of times when you when you're reading papers and stuff, you often see, or I at least often see, um, people just say that. You know, they're fitting some model and they say, we don't have any information, so we choose an uninformative prior that's a flat prior. And that's the end of the discussion for that, for the entire paper. Yeah. Can you comment yeah. on whether you think that people are generally using flat priors and non-informative priors correctly right now? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit tricky, right? Because um, I think if, if someone just says, we are using a flat prior, um, and don't put any more thought into that, then it, you can, that can be uh, that can be a, a bit of a red flag, but on the other hand, and you know they're they're trying trying to do this non-informative thing, but doing the full non-informative prior is sometimes difficult. And I'm guessing Robert has a as an opinion. Oh, just there was a recent um, kerfuffle on Astro P8. Somebody posted a paper. Did you follow this? No, I didn't. Where somebody wrote a paper saying a new principled approach to something or other using non-prior free statistics. <laughs> and Paul jumped on them, pointing out, as you say, that no, that's not quite what you mean. You mean you're making this assumption about the price. Yeah. So there are times that people overclaim in the literature. And I think mostly I agree with Jay that people just um, sort of brush it under the covers and hope that it doesn't matter. I'll yeah. give an example where you may have lots of data, the priors really mess you up if you try to include them later. So you can't quite okay. always ignore it. Yeah, I should also mention there was there was another thing. So I was involved in the uh, um, the Sloan II supernova project with uh, yeah, the this Kessler et al. paper in, in 2009. And there's a really interesting thing there that we were doing. Um, we, we needed some sort of prior model on the flux from supernova in, in the whole analysis. And we know physically that flux can't be negative, right? So if you, if you actually cut off the, the, the probability distribution for flux at zero, um, that's something that's sort of this empirically motivated prior, but that turned out to be uh, not not super significant, but significant enough that we had to worry about what to do about it. Because if you did if you did this physically motivated prior where flux couldn't be less than zero, it was uh, a different result than if you allowed the flux the, the uncertainty of the flux to kind of like uh, sneak below zero, and that kind of thing is one of the reasons why this Kessler 2009 paper is like 120 pages long because when we run into the, ran into those uh, difficulties, we had to explore both routes and try to decide which approach mattered. So, so priors can be sort of sticky things when um, when you're coming up with these. Yeah, whenever you've got relatively low signal to noise, which is when you weren't in, yeah. you absolutely have to worry about the priors and the biases that come out of the priors and the, the almost always trade-offs. And in the, in the science, like here's an example in the Kessler et al. paper. If you're doing faint galaxy photometry, you have to decide whether to use priors or not. Then they give you bias as a function of magnitude. Mm -hmm. You would never accept that in stellar photometry, but you have to in the galaxy photometry, or else you have to do something else on principle. So mm -hmm. it, the whole game of priors is very closely tied up in the science we're going to do. It looks just like a phase theorem analysis. Yeah. But as <laughs> I mean, I agree with Jake, it's really hairy. It's, it's hairy because it's science. Not just statistics. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to mention one more, just because, just for completeness. Another approach to priors that you see is this thing called conjugate priors. And this is basically uh, this. This is something that was popular in the mid 20th century um, because what a conjugate prior is is it makes 
It's a, a special form of prior such that when you multiply it by the likelihood, it makes the posterior a nice function to work with. So if you have, if you have a certain likelihood, you can choose a conjugate prior and you can do these sorts of things um, analytically. And that's kind of nice in like the, you know, if you're a mathematician sitting in a room writing on yellow notepads. But if you actually want to do science, um, conjugate priors are, are not a good choice because they, you're imposing these assumptions on your scientific process that have nothing to do with reality. They just have to do with mathematical, con mathematical convenience. And you'll still see um, people write screeds against Bayesianism that talk about how conjugate priors are really bad. And uh, I would say I agree they are really bad. You, you should never use them. Um, but just, just know that they exist. And if you, if you ever take like an intro to Bayesian statistics in a, in a stats department or in a math department, they might spend uh, weeks and weeks on conjugate priors because they just love the beauty of how when you multiply them together, you get this nice function and you can do everything cleanly. It's the analogy of Soviet mathematics always with the special function, the heterogeometric function. <laughs> Maybe. It's the only thing they could do because they didn't have computers. They wouldn't do it now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So these are, these are kind of the four types of priors that you'll see in, um, when you actually do some analysis. So um, I hope all this wasn't, wasn't too abstract. Uh, it, I, I want to make things a little more concrete now by, by working out a problem and showing you this approach in reality. Um, so, so why don't we do that? Can I, can I erase all this stuff? Are you, you happy with it? Okay. And like I said in that, all, all this is more or less written down in those notes that I, um, that I posted before. So you can, you can, you can look at those in a, in a much better typeface there. Okay, so let's talk about um, the, classic, the classic statistical problem, fitting a line to data, right? Everyone loves fitting lines to data. Um, so we have this, these data points that looks, look like this, and each one of these has an xi comma yi that defines it. And uh, let's even make it, just for fun, let's give these an error bar to uh, epsilon i. So you can imagine each of these points has a little error bar, and it's the xi, yi, epsilon i that we had for the data. And this, this is equal, this is our data right here, a big, big D in the, in the Bayesian analysis. So let, let me write Bayes' theorem here just so we have it again. So P of theta given D equals P of D given theta times the prior P of theta over the FML P of theta. Right, so we have these, so, so again, the, the D here, the data, equals the set of XI, YI, and epsilon i, or the epsilon are the, are the error bars. And um, we're going to want to fit a line to data. So the, um, what we usually parameterize the line by is this intercept b and this slope uh, m, right? So you're, you're used to that. You've done that before. So the theta, the theta here is a vector of um, b comma m. So um, now we want to compute this posterior. Uh, the, the easy thing to, to compute first is this likelihood. And the likelihood, if, you, if you've ever fit a line to data, you've probably constructed the likelihood before, because this is the, the classic way to do it. And what the, what the likelihood is, is, we want to know the P of data given theta. So we, we want to know the, the probability of this set of xi, yi, sigma i, given our model parameters, our slope and our, in our intercept and our slope. Um, and this is where uh, we often, we'll usually make an assumption, right? You, we want a probability of all these numbers together. But if each of these points is independent, if, it doesn't, if each point, in a sense, it doesn't depend on the value of the previous one, or I should say, if, if the error in each point doesn't pr depend on the error in another point, um, we can turn this into a product where we do a product over all the i's of the probability of xi, yi, 
sigma i given the b and the m, the slope and the intercept. So this is the um, this is the fundamental assumption that goes into a lot of likelihood calculations. You're, you're multiplying together the, the independent probability of each data point, um, and, and the result is this, this probability over all the data points. So this is just, uh, if, if you remember from before, this is just a joint probability over the, all the x, y, and, and um, am I saying sigma or epsilon? Epsilons. And, um, this is when you have a joint probability and everything's independent, you can turn it into a product of all the individual probabilities. Right, so we, we saw that a little bit in, um, in Maria's slides earlier. So now what's the, uh, what is this probability here? Well, we're saying um, that for, for any individual point, if here, here's our y right here, there's some model y right there, which equals, the model equals m x plus b and we're saying that there's some error around this this epsilon and that the probability is uh, is a Gaussian around that so when you when you use Gaussian error bars what you're saying is that my data is in a probability distribution that's a Gaussian about my model is that clear right there I'm sort of jumping into this so so what we end up with then is um, we're, we're doing a product of all these different little Gaussian distributions for each data point. So the way you can think about this is that this is like a Gaussian here for this data point, Gaussian here for this data point, Gaussian here for this one. And um, where the probability lands is, is where along the error bars this, this model fits for the data. So it's a way of, uh, of taking into account how close all these points are to the model. Um, with their probability distributions, right? So what, what this ends up being then is just a big, massive, ugly, ugly probability. I'm gonna use a proportionality because I can never remember what the, um, actually no, I can sometimes remember. Why don't I do it to use an equal sign? So this is the probability of one over root two pi epsilon squared, epsilon i squared, so you, you've seen this before. This is the, the definition of a Gaussian times the exponent, exponentiation of yi minus ym squared over 2 epsilon i squared. So that right there is, oh, maybe in the minus sign there. Otherwise, it's not a Gaussian. So this is the expression for the likelihood right here. We're just multiplying a bunch of individual Gaussians together. and um, and we, we get that result out. So now I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna shift over to this projector here, <laughs> assuming I can turn it on again. Because at this point, um, we've gone about as far as we'd, we'd really want to by hand, because once you start having a lot of data, set, of data in your data set, you want to, um, you want to, to jump into it. So I'm, I'm gonna go to the solution number two, because this was actually, uh, in the big course that I taught, this was posed as an exercise for the students. Um, so solution number two, um, I'm gonna restart and run all just so, so we can see what's going on here. So um, I've created some Python code that does this just so you can see how it goes. So we're, we're making some data, it's just randomly seeded data. You have x from zero to 100, y equals the intercept, intercept plus the slope times x, and then you have some, um, randomly distributed errors here and you and you put them together. So this is what our data looks like. So basically what we saw there. And now um, we're going to define the likelihood and this if you take the if you take the log of this expression, it's really nice because the log of the product ends up being the sum of logs. So you don't have any products anymore and the, the log of an exponential just takes away this. So you can, you can write this in Python this way. Um, so the, the log likelihood is at a given theta, we say the model is, the y model is theta zero plus theta one times x. And then the log of that expression is the sum of this log of two pi dy squared plus the sum of y y model squared over dy squared. And so you can see that that's the exact, that's the, the exact thing we computed above. Did you make an apology for that? Yeah, 
Do you want people to be executing this or just following? Uh, just, just you can follow, just follow along. along. If you okay. want to, if you want to go and execute it later, you can, you can take a look. All right. And then, um, what what you can do here, the the frequentist approach now, um, will will stop at this likelihood, and the frequentist approach says, I just want to maximize this likelihood because I don't care about priors and posteriors and all that, and for for Relatively good reasons, um, you can say in frequentism that maximizing the likelihood is a good thing to do to find the model parameters. Um, and so you can do this sort of thing with uh, scipy optimize. Here's a minimum func, uh, here, here's a function that returns a function to be minimized, the negative log likelihood. You can minimize it with this optimize and then get the result. And, and here, let's see what the input is. The, the true theta is, is an intercept of 25 and a slope of 0 0.5. The, the maximum of the, of the likelihood is an uh, intercept of 24.8 and a slope of 0 0.47, right? So we're, the, the maximum likelihood is giving, giving us something reasonably close to the input. Now this, uh, if you, let's see. Oh yeah, so there's all this code that you can write to do things like this, like to um, where was it? Oh yeah, so so then if, if you want to actually do this, so that, that was the frequentist method right there. This just maximizing the um, or minimizing maximizing the likelihood is, gives you the frequentist result. If you want to do the Bayesian result, then what you need is um, some sort of you need you need a prior to do here, right? Because if you're if you're maximizing this, you need to do the the max of the likelihood times the prior. And since you're maximizing it, you can just kind of get rid of that because that doesn't depend on theta. So this is where um, the choice of priors come in, and um, and in, in the linear model section, I'm, I don't have time to, to really go, go into this, but let's non-informative. Um, so in the, in the, in the linear, uh, where is this? Okay, so for, for a linear model, a, a true non-informative prior is basically saying well, the, the problem is, is that if you, do, uh, if you do a flat prior on the slope m, you're basically saying that a slope from 0 to 1 is just as likely as a slope from 1 to 2, which is just as likely as a slope from 1 to 2 to 3, 3 to 4, or 4 to 5. And you basically say that this region up here with really steep lines is almost, uh, is the probability of the, of the slope being up here is very, very big, right? I guess greater than one is not good, but. Anyway, do you, sorry, do you, see, do you see what I'm saying there? If you, if you say that any, any range, of, any unit range in slope is equally probable, then you're saying that this range is equal to this range is equal to this range is equal to this range, and you're heavily weighting the um, very, very steep slopes. Because a, a slope of a million to a million plus one is the same probability of a slope from zero to one. So uh, a flat prior in a, in a linear context is not all that great, but a flat prior, uh, a non-informative prior that you can derive is something that looks like this. Um, the probability of the slope is one plus the slope squared to the minus three halves. And I'm just, right now I'm just going to uh, state that and I have some references in here that, that sort of go into why you might choose something like that. Um, but it, one, one thing to note though is this was one plus m squared to the minus one half. If you think about trigonometry, you might remember that that has something to do with the, with the tangent, right? So this is kind of like saying that you have a flat prior not on m, but you have a flat prior on this angle phi here. So it's so any any angle of the line is equally likely. So that, so this is one of the things like the the difference between the flat prior and the non-informative prior is relatively important here. So when you code that up, when you code that up, it looks like this. So the flat prior is um, 
you, you need a cutoff, so I just said if the slope or the intercept is greater than 1,000, we're going to say that that's, that's cut off. Or if it's, uh, if it's less than negative 1,000, we're going to return 0. So log of, log of minus infinity, sorry, log, log flat prior, what did I do? Oh yeah, so log of, uh, if, if these are, are within the range minus 1,000 to 1,000, then it's um, equally likely, and we just return zero because log of one is zero. We have some proportional thing. And then if we're outside that range, we, turn, we return minus infinity because the log of zero is minus infinity. So we're, we're drawing this uh, prior that looks kind of like this. Um, here's m in the middle, and it's, uh, it's a top hat centered on zero that goes out to plus 1,000. So that's, that's the flat prior. And then the, uh, the non-informative prior, this, this symmetric prior, looks like this. Minus the, the log of it looks like this 1 plus theta squared. Log of that times minus 1.5. So it's, uh, what does that end up being? It ends up being something, something looking like this, right? Roughly, I don't know the, the exact cutoff. So th those are the two priors that we're using. One of them is motivated by just wanting a flat prior. One of them is motivated by wanting some sort of information theoretic non-informative prior. And what you end up with when you, um, you can define a function to, to plot this with the contour levels, and you end up with, for this data that we put in, the flat prior and the symmetric prior give these results. So here's the slope on the x-axis and the intercept on the y-axis. And these are one, two, and three sigma contours that you might be used to seeing in like cosmological papers, right? So the, the maximum is right in the middle, and the maximum between these two is basically the same. The, even the, the, the errors on these two are basically the same. So what we've found is in this case, with this much data, the, the choice of the prior just doesn't matter. Now if we scroll down a little bit, and um, let's say we do a, a different data set. Here's a, here's a data set with uh, just three points and very large error bars. Right, so this is kind of the extreme of where you don't have, your data doesn't really inform your model very well. And if we run the same thing and plot the two results, then we see that the difference between the symmetric flat prior and the flat prior really matters. It kind of bumps up the, the slope and intercept. But um, well, this makes sense, right? Because our data really isn't telling us much about, about the system. Um, so in that case, when you, when you don't have much constraint on your system, you're just going to go straight for what you believed before, right? So that, that's the nice thing about Bayesian analysis, uh, in my mind, is that you can really um, interpret what these results are. And things like the meaning of the prior, the importance of the prior, really make sense. Um, so this would be similar to saying, like, I have, I have some knowledge of the universe from WMAP. And I observed one supernova, and I want to see how that affects things. You know, it's, it's not going to affect things. You just, WMAP is your result. But if you start with WMAP and you apply a million supernova from LSST, then you have enough information to start shifting things around. And whether you use WMAP or BAO as your prior is going to change things. Or is, is not going to change things in the end. Cool, so, um, yeah, so we've done, we've done a Bayesian model of it now, right? So it's, it's all this, uh, it's all this background, all this kind of formalism that gives you this machinery that then you can use to, uh, to find the posterior and find the results that you're interested in. Um, and right now, I think this is a good time to take a little break because, uh, this has been pretty dense. So why don't we break for about 10 minutes and then come back and um, after we come back, what I'm gonna do is talk about um, how Bayesian analysis is done in practice. Because this was a simple example that we could plot on a screen with two dimensions. But if you have something like a 100 dimensional data or 20, 20 dimensional model, uh, it gets a little bit diff more difficult and there's some approaches that we can use. So. Um, it is 12, no, 214 right now.